Dragon Quest. Easily one of the greatest role-playing franchises in gaming history. It's got quite a number of mainline entries, as well as its fair share of spinoffs. Its influence can be seen everywhere. So, today I shall be ranking them. Hello, and welcome to SCPO Steel Gaming. My name is Sean O'Donnell, and yes, today I'm going to be ranking the Dragon Quest franchise. Now, I'm only ranking the mainline entries in the series, and I'm only ranking the ones that have actually been released in the U.S. So, that's going to be said. We're looking at 10 titles total today. You may be wondering, but aren't we at number 11? Yes, but number 10 was only released in Japan as an MMO. So, I will not be counting that one in this ranking video. So, 10 entries. How do they stack up? Let's jump in and see. At number 10, we are looking at Dragon Quest VI. Now, this one puts you in the role of a band of heroes as they're trying to stop the Demon King, Mudo. This game fluctuates between the real world and the dream world, and also includes character classes, what have you. I'm putting this at number 10, because this was the one that I found to be the least interesting. The story just didn't grab me. Characters, not that memorable. I just didn't find this one to be the most enjoyable. It's got a lot going for it. Don't get me wrong. The DS remake in particular looks great. There's a lot of interesting aspects to this game. But I just found the whole experience underwhelming. It's nowhere near my favorite. And... It was one of the entries I had the hardest time getting through. Not because it was difficulty, but just because it was that unremarkable. At number nine, we have... Dragon Quest Nine. So this was the first new entry for the DS, and it's a unique and interesting game. This game doesn't have your traditional party members. In fact, you create all of them. The game also is pretty heavy on the emphasis of multiplayer. This is, first and foremost, a multiplayer-style game, with up to four people able to play at the same time. And I guess, to me, that's where this game falters, at least in my opinion. Because there is such emphasis on the multiplayer, there isn't as much emphasis on character development and so forth. Story-wise, I honestly don't remember much about the story. It's a fun title. It's unique. But 
it's not necessarily one that I go back to playing and enjoying. It's an okay game. Don't get me wrong. But... It's not the most memorable in my opinion. At number eight, we have Dragon Quest three. And of the original trilogy, this is the one that I have the least amount of nostalgia for. The game puts you in the role of the offspring of the hero Ortega, as you must <clears throat> travel the world to find out what happened to your father, as well as stop the evil forces of Baramos. This game took... A couple steps forward, but in some ways also took a step or two back. So this game is about customization. And what I mean by that is you create pretty much your entire party from the get-go. You'll go to Patty's party planning and you'll develop your team from there. The game also introduces the class system, and later on you can go through and change character classes, customize skills, stuff like that. All in all, it comes together well. But that's also where some of this game's faults also lie. Because there's such a heavy emphasis on character customization and stuff like that, it's very grind-heavy. And especially uh, for the NES ones, that's always been a big issue, is how grind-heavy it is. Now, subsequent remakes and ports, it's not as bad, but... Because we're dealing with customized characters, there's not much room for character development. And so, as a whole, it's, it's the least memorable of the stories. Now, don't get me wrong, it's got a nice twist towards the end, but... Of the original trilogy, this is the one that I find myself going back to the least. Not that it's not a fun game, but... I just... I find it fairly... Basic. At number seven, we have, well, Dragon Quest Seven, And this is the first entry to see a stateside release since Dragon Quest Four. It's also one of the last entries, it's the last mainline entry to also go under the Dragon Warrior moniker. And... This game is huge. There is so much going on with this game. Great story, lots of memorable characters, stuff like that. But this is no simple feat. The mainline story by itself is over a hundred hours long roughly. And that doesn't include the various side quests and stuff like that. <clears throat> the story of this game puts you in the role of pretty much a band of children as you travel throughout the world trying to piece it back together. 
A dark force has pretty much splintered all the nations of the world into these kind of shadow realms. And by collecting fragments of these Traveler Stones, you can go to these different areas and restore them to where they once were. Upon doing so, they then appear on the main world. This game, like I said, is huge. It looks great. It brings back, once again, the character class system which leaves room for customization and there's just so much to this game and ultimately <clears throat> I do think this may be part of the game's detriment is that because it is so big that for some, it may drag on. I still had fun with it, though. I was very excited when I saw I was getting a U.S. release, and I mean, I remember I picked it up the day it came out, and I played all the way through it. But I don't also have the most nostalgia for it. I don't remember much of the story. Like I said, it's a huge, huge game. But it's still a fun entry. Some might find the DS, or I think it's 3DS, port to be more accessible. They kind of trim the fat a little bit on there, but the PlayStation release is also a great playthrough. It's a huge game. It's worth the time. But it might be a little too much for some. <clears throat> Number six, we have the game that started it all, Dragon Quest, or Dragon Warrior, depending on which version you're playing. So this game puts you in the role of the descendant of the hero of Erdrick, and you have to basically go through the kingdom of Alephgard to stop the Dragon Lord. This game is pretty basic. You only have one character, and when you go to random battles, you're only fighting one enemy at a time. You're not fighting multiples like you would see in a lot of other role-playing games and so forth. But in many ways, that's also what makes this a great entry-level role-playing game. It's not the most difficult, especially in later re-releases. If you do the NES port, you're going to have a bit of a rough time. It's very grind heavy. But it's in that simplicity that this game has its charm. You can beat this game in a day. At least later ports, you can beat in a day. It's overall it's well designed. I have a lot of fun with it. I've gone and I've played do this one many times. And overall, it's just, it's a great game across the board. I really can't say much more than that. At number five, we have Dragon Quest II or Dragon Warrior 2, once again, depending on localization and port and so forth. And this one takes place many years after the first one. And you play the descendants of the hero from the first game. And in this one, you have to stop the evil forces of the 
sorcerer Hargon from basically destroying the world. This game has a little more story to it, though not much. And it introduced a number of little innovations to that would come on subsequent ports later. From a ship that you can sail in, m multiple party members, each of them are very unique in their own stats and so forth. This game was the first one I ever played. And then by the first one, meaning the NES version. And it's what got me into role-playing games. As a whole, it's a lot of fun. Now, once you get the ship and the world fully opens up, it's easy to get lost. There's not much sense of direction in this game. And probably that's the game's biggest flaw. You don't have the best sense of where you're needing to go and what you're trying to find. And <clears throat> like I said, I think that's really the biggest game's detriment. But it's a lot of fun. The characters are pretty memorable. The monsters all look great. This is just overall a great game across the board, and I would definitely recommend this one. At number four, we have Dragon Quest XI. And this is the most recent entry. And I will confess, to date, I have not completed it. But I have had a lot of fun with it. So this game puts you in the role of basically the luminary, or the hero. And you have to basically, once again, save the world from the forces of darkness. This game is beautiful. It's amazing to look at. I like the characters. They're all, from what I've encountered so far, pretty memorable. The battle system has also gotten an interesting upgrade. So there's two ways you can do the battle system here. One is kind of a full control of your character's movement, stuff like that. Though it, <clears throat> from what I've seen, it really doesn't play as much of a factor into defense and stuff like that. Or you can switch it to the traditional battle style. I prefer the traditional battle style. You also get various modes of transportation, stuff like horses and stuff like that, to travel around the world, most of which you could summon at pretty much any time. You also encounter all the enemies on the open world, so there's no real random battles you choose when you want to battle. And I like all this. It's a great, interesting, and fun title. And I definitely look forward to seeing where the story concludes. Overall, I mean, this is a fun, fun game. And if you get the Switch version in particular, which is a, the definitive edition, you also get the option to play in like a classic 2D mode, which I think is really cool too. So, overall, great game. Definitely worth playing. Number five. 
Number three, we have Dragon Quest VIII. And this game is awesome. So, once again, you take the role of the hero. And you must help the cursed king from, to basically be restored to his former glory. This game has a lot going for it. First off, it's beautiful. It is absolutely beautiful. It stands out from the rest of the pack, especially on the PlayStation 2. The characters are also very memorable. From Yangus to Jessica, it's they're all very memorable. And it's a very compact group of characters. So you have a lot more room for development. Now, the main enemy, I did not find to be the most memorable. But the characters, the story, the look, everything about this game stands out from the rest. And I would definitely, definitely recommend this one. It is so much fun to play. Well worth the time. It's also been re-released on the 3DS. I have not played that one. But the at least the original PlayStation 2 version, one of the best. At number two, we have Dragon Quest V. And this one, bar none, has one of the best stories, not just of any Dragon Quest game, but of any role-playing game, period. This game is a generational title. So you start off as, of course, the hero... And the game starts off when you are a little kid. Then you later transition to when you're basically a young adult. And the game ends when you are an adult with children of your own. This game has the best story. It's very heartfelt. You feel for the characters going through... You will meet women that one of uh, the three, one will become your bride, and that will affect later aspects of the game in regards to your own offspring. But the thing that helps make this game stand out from the rest of the pack is this was the first game to introduce recruiting monsters onto your party. And this makes a huge, huge difference in the gameplay. You start off with a great saber cub that will later turn into the great saber cat. You can recruit so many different monsters, and all of them are very different. They all have their own unique stats and abilities. This game's just got so, so much going for it. The enemies are memorable. The story's fantastic. I mean, there's a reason why this game is often revered as one of the best games ever made. And in fact, the Netflix movie that recently was released is based off this game. That will tell you how good and memorable this story is. This is one of the best. It stands out from the rest. And really, if you play only one entry, this is one that I would be hard-pressed to say this would be the one to play. It's available on mobile, 
That's probably going to be the easiest way to get your hands on it. But it's also released on the DS, though it's gone up in value since then. I would love to see this game get ported to the Switch and other systems. But for now, get it where you can. Definitely check it out and play it. Number one, we have Dragon Quest IV. This is not only my personal favorite Dragon Quest game, it's also one of my favorite games. It's actually my all-time favorite game. So this game is very unique from the rest. The game is split into five chapters, six if you look at the recent remake. And each chapter is its own core story. Chapter one, you play as a knight Ragnar who has to figure out who is kidnapping the children of your kingdom. Chapter 2 puts you in the role of a tomboyish princess, Elena, as she is trying to become the strongest one there is. Chapter 3 puts you in the role of the merchant, Torneco, who is trying to become the best merchant possible. And Chapter 4 puts you in the role of two gypsy sisters who are trying to get revenge for the murder of their father. And then chapter five, they all come together to help the hero from saving the, to save the world. This game's just amazing. All the standalone stories are fantastic. And when they all come together, it creates a much larger and memorable experience. I absolutely love this game. And while my personal preference is the NES version, because that's the one I'll admit I have the most nostalgia for, I do concede that the DS remake and subsequent mobile ports is not only more accessible, it's got a lot better quality of life improvements. One of the flaws that I will admit to at least the NES version is when you get to the fifth chapter, you no longer have control of your party members. You have to use a tactic system to basically dictate their what they do basically in combat. But in the subsequent remakes, you can go back to controlling them. But the thing that I love the most about this game, and it's something that I really wish more games did more of. In fact, the, uh, for the rest of the Dragon Quest series, that wasn't done since. But it's got the most memorable villain in Sorrow. So Sorrow is a monster. Kind of looks like an elf. And he is trying to basically establish the monster's dominance of the world. He is doing so because, and this is... Uh, not really spoilers, but he's doing so because he views humans as inferior. But he's also the most relatable villain of any series. And as the story progresses, you actually come to sympathize and feel for him. 
And so it makes that final battle against him, at least to me, more heartbreaking. Because you understand his motivations. And for an NES era RPG especially, that was unheard of. Most role-playing games, the villains... I'm not going to say they're one-dimensional, but you you don't fully grasp their motivations. It's usually, oh, I'm the big bad, I'm evil, I'm psychotic, I'm whatever. In fact, the only other role-playing game villain off the top of my head that I would be able to compare Sorrow to in terms of understanding his motivations and why he does what he does is Sephiroth from Final Fantasy VII, who is another villain that, in some ways, I feel you come to sympathize with as you understand the story and his plight. And don't get me wrong, I'm sure there's others out there, but as in regards to villains, Sorrow is he's at the very top for me. And that's what helps this game stand out from the rest. And between the broken up chapters, all the different party members, mu- pretty much all of which are frequently seen in cameos and appear in other games. Most of the subsequent Dragon Quest spinoff titles, stuff like that, you will find a lot of characters from number four pop up in those games. In fact, even in Dragon Quest VIII, some of these characters pop up in a... There's like an arena minigame. So that shows how overwhelmingly memorable all these characters are. (laughs) Honestly, I could talk about this game for days. But, yeah... For the mainline Dragon Quest series, number four is the absolute best, in my opinion. And I would recommend this one any day of the week. This one's also available on mobile. That's going to be the easiest way to get your hands on it. Though I would probably say, for accessibility standpoint also, the DS version would probably be the best route to go as well. So that is my friends, is the rankings for the mainline Dragon Quest series as released in the U.S. So, to recap, it's starting at number 10 was Dragon Quest 6, then we got Dragon Quest 9, 3, 7, 1, 2, 11, 8, 5, and 4. As far as gameplay, all of these are great to play. These are all fun and fantastic games. Some are going to be more memorable than others. Each one of them provides a very unique and different experience. But they all also carry a lot of the same stylings of previous games. And that's probably one of the things I love the most about this. The Dragon Quest series, I guess the best way to put it is that it's kind of like a comfort food role-playing game. You can pick up any entry and from a gameplay standpoint, for the most part, and be able to just jump right in and be able to enjoy and know what you're doing. It's not like, say, Final Fantasy, where they try to 
change the wheel with every entry, at least since number seven. This game, this is a great series. And really, none of these games are bad. Some are going to be more memorable than others, obviously, but that goes with any franchise. If you're into role-playing games and you haven't played Dragon Quest, definitely do so. They're all fun, fun titles. So there you go. That is my rankings for the Dragon Quest series. Ten games, all worth playing. Maybe one time I'll do the spinoffs, but we'll see. Anyway, that's it for now. Thank you for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe. I'll see you next time.